Well, hello and welcome. We are here live from the Jazz Loft, our second episode in our new series called Music and Conversation. I am Tom Manuel, the president and founder of the Jazz Loft here in Stony Brook Village. And I am joined by the incomparable Mr. Steve Salerno on guitar. Hello. And our special, special guest today is Mr. Ray Anderson yeah. on the trombone. Ray Anderson, who's thank also, you, the, also the vice president of the Jazz Loft. So yeah. he's, he's got like major presidential, yeah. vice presidential <laughs> stature on, nice. this, on this stage here today. I'm yeah. in charge of vice. Yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> start off with one of his tunes, which is called Alligatory Roomba, right? This is the Alligatory Roomba. Yes, it, it's, uh, there's a series of alligatories, which is a word that I made up. That's why you don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> and alligatory is, of course, part alligator, but it is also partly allegorical, like an allegory, and it's also partly Alligatoric. So if you think of lizards randomly snapping in a tail, then you have a definition of alligatory. <laughs> Man, I don't think I'm qualified to play this tune. <laughs> I feel very good. The tune is very <laughs> simple. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is the uh, this is the alligatory rumba.
part um, you know I'm, I'm always trying to think of questions that aren't the normal ones like you know which are important questions though but you know like who inspired you and this and that and, but you know one question I'd love to ask of you is I know that you know your career is really impressive for sure and, and you know you've been able to share the bandstand and, and learn and absorb and contribute to big names that so many of our listeners would know Charlie mm -hmm. Mingus and Jim Jufri, and, mm -hmm. um, but you're known for pushing the music forward, um, especially back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s when you started. And, I, and my question is, I say all that to say this, when people talk about you and your crew of musicians, they say avant-garde, or they use the label modern, or <laughs> they, or they'll say new, which are all great words. Yeah. But my question for you is, how would you label your music? Uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question, actually. And uh, I would say there really isn't anything all that new in, in my music. Or, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful question because I always tell people that we shouldn't think of jazz history as linear. It's the tendency with history is always to put is always to make it on a line. This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and this influenced this, and then that happened, and so we have this line like this. But it seems to me it's a very limited way of understanding jazz history and understanding the music that we're making now, because if you think of it more as as a circle then you realize that everything is actually still going on that, that began. So if we think of Louis Armstrong in 1927 and the way he was playing the trumpet then and uh, the rhythmic sophistication of what he was doing and the, um, just that amazing Louis Armstrong stuff, it's not out of date. And a 
lot of what I do is directly inspired by Louis Armstrong. You know, I'm likely to throw some Louis Armstrong quote in the middle of all that madness. So, you know, things have changed. Certainly, we have expanded from always improvising on a set of chord changes to maybe, okay, we're going to improvise the chord changes. Mm -hmm. So now we'll improvise the harmony as well as the melody. And instead of like a tune has a certain tempo or rhythmic feeling, and maybe now we're, we're gonna say, okay, we can change that. We can improvise the, the rhythmic feeling too. It doesn't have to stay in the time that it starts in, or right. it, could go, right. it could go all these different places. So I, I write music that, that um, in, the, in the wonderful, wonderful Oliver Lake phrase, you know, Oliver Lake, an incredible alto saxophone player from St. Louis, he has a poem, which I can't quote, but where he says, put all my food on the same plate. <laughs> I just love that from Lake, yeah. you know, because it, it really says it, you know, it's like, we don't put all the food on the same plate. Louis is there, yeah. you know, Duke is there, Albert Eiler is there, Cecil yeah. Taylor is there. Yeah. I spent some years playing with Anthony Braxton. I learned a great deal from him. And, and that's music that certainly pushes the, the boundaries of, you know, traditional music in terms of its sonic and rhythmic complexities or, you know, the way the improvisation works. So, uh, so different tunes have really different parameters and are mining different areas of this wonderful circular history, right. you know, and, and, and that's, that's deliberate on my, my part because I love all that stuff. What you're you saying, know? <laughs> yeah, what you're saying reminds yeah. me of, uh, I remember getting to hang with the great writer Albert Murray, and I asked him, mm. I said, man, you, you were so blessed, you've like interviewed all these people, met all these musicians, I said, what was one that really stood out to you? And he said, well, you might say stood out, he said, but the one that challenged me the most was he asked Jackie McLean once, and this was back in the 60s, mm. um, and he asked McLean, you know, where do you see the direction of the new music going? And he said, I was thinking future, I was thinking now, and McLean laughed at me and said, oh man, all the new music's in the past, wow. and he walked away. Yeah. And he said, it took me a while, he said, I think the first day or two, I was insulted and thought he blew me off. He said, but the more I thought about it, I realized, Oh no, he was serious. Yeah, and it's yeah. like you said, it's all he's, there. He's saying what I'm saying. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Very, right. Cool. Right. very cool. It's a, it's really really limiting to to think of it as linear, right. you know, as right. as generational because um, nothing actually has become outdated. You know, it, it's all it's all perfect in itself, and yet. You know, the challenge of jazz is for each of us to become ourselves. Right. So find your own voice. Yeah. The yeah. challenge is can you find your own voice where you don't sound like the people on whom whose shoulders you are standing, mm -hmm. you know, but that you in fact do climb up there and stand on them. You know, and make another little link in whatever human chain this is. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. so right. that that being the challenge, then of course you're going to look for what feels unique t to you and what sort of expresses your your soul, your your heart. You know, right. and that's different for every every person. And this is this is has a lot to do with the beauty of, of jazz and why this is such an incredibly significant art form, mm -hmm. you know, born out of the African American experience here mm -hmm. and and like like nothing else in that it's truly welcoming for everybody mm -hmm. and it asks everyone to become who they are and develop themselves in the context of the community. Mm -hmm. Because jazz is all about community. You really can't play jazz by yourself. I mean, you know, <laughs> you know, which we do yeah. sometimes, and I, it's I a lot more fun with friends. I even <laughs> made a solo record now, finally, after all these years. But it, it's not the thing. It's yeah, not the right, thing, right. you know. And that's why we're we're having a hard time in COVID. It's, it's such a pleasure to 
be here with you all. I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to be out of my house and playing music with you guys. <laughs> what do you say we play another tune? Yeah. Let's play another tune. And uh, this song, uh, this whole performance will be compositions of Ray Anderson and a few of my own as well. And this tune we're going to play is one of my compositions that I wrote uh, last summer. And it's called Davis Melville. And it was inspired by two really gorgeous parks that I got to spend some time in during the summer uh, playing, writing, and composing. Uh, Davis Park, which is uh, on Fire Island. And there is a wonderful park that's here in Stony Brook, right near where Ray and I live. Uh, it's actually in Setauk, it's called the, um, the Frank Melville Park. And so this is a mashup of, of Davis Park and Frank Melville Park, and the tune is called Davis Melville. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is our, our trio interpretation of of this tune. Sounds mm -hmm. good. Yeah, here mm -hmm. we go. Thank you. 
So, um, <laughs> so man, um, you know, I know that for all of us, our background certainly influences, you know, who we are and our, our character as well as just our stories and what we experience. And I, I know for you, having had the incredible honor to, to learn from you and study from you and play, play with you. So thank you for that. Oh. But I know that your your childhood growing up in Chicago is very much so a part of your sound and a part of who you are. And I, I know that that wonderful entire suite of music you wrote was very much so the sweet ch Chicago suite had a lot mm -hmm. to do with that. So mm -hmm. I, I just thought it'd be cool if maybe you shared one or two of reflections on Chicago growing up as a kid. I remember you telling me recently about you know the protests in Chicago back in the day. And yeah. Letting you go to some, but not others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm very lucky to grow up in Chicago. I was born in 52, so I was definitely a part of the movements that occurred all through the 60s. I mean, I was young, but very much aware of all of this. And I, I grew up in the community called Hyde Park on the south side of Chicago, which is where the University of Chicago is and where they control a great deal of the land because that's a big major university. And uh, Chicago is right on the lake, of course, on Lake Michigan. So Hyde Park is, is, is on, the, on the lake. But all around Hyde Park, everywhere along there, is a, that's a black community. So I was incredibly lucky to grow up uh, knowing a lot of black musicians and hearing a lot of black music and meeting, you know, and being being able to, to participate in this culture from a, you know, from a distance. I mean, I'm a white middle class kid, but I grew up in that environment and it, and it had a tremendous effect on me. The, the uh, Chicago's the center of the world for the blues and uh, I was very fortunate to have some wonderful teachers that turned me on to a bunch of stuff and just I just think of myself as really lucky to have had this experience so we heard you know in the in the 60s we were dancing to Chicago blues but also Motown but also James Brown you know but also the Jefferson Airplane and you know Sly and the Family Stone and all that but I came up playing jazz I wanted to play jazz from the moment I heard it pretty much. My father had a few uh, Louis Armstrong records. He was no kind of connoisseur of jazz or super knowledgeable. It was not a musical family, you know. And, uh, but uh, I did hear Louis Armstrong and Truman Young and Vic Dickinson and other people playing, you know, like trad jazz, like New Orleans style jazz. And, so when they asked me to, what instrument do you want to play, I picked the trombone because of that sound, wow. you know. Yeah. And, uh, and it turns out that was probably pretty good choice, it seems like. Yeah. Anyway, I haven't had sense enough to quit yet. 
Now, talking That's what about, I always say. <laughs> now, talking about records, I know you told me, maybe Colt can share this story about where you and your friends would go. Was it on Sundays for Cadillac? Was it Cadillac? Yeah, Joe? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wonderful experience. Uh, the the uh, father of a good friend of ours who played the trumpet. So my brother played clarinet, I played trombone. Dan Erickson played trumpet, and we were trying to play tra jazz with yeah. that traditional lineup. And his dad was a very cruel guy who uh, was an artist and taught art and would take us to Maxwell Street on an occasional Sunday. Maxwell Street is the famous Chicago open air market. It starts early Sunday morning and it's downtown Chicago just outside of the real, like the loop, what they call the loop where all the really big buildings are. And during the week, it, back in those days, Maxwell Street was Skid Row. That's mm -hmm. where all the winos were. There's all these flop houses and like really run down area. Mm -hmm. But on Sunday morning, it transformed into this enormous outdoor flea market thing. And people brought all kinds of stuff there. You could buy, I mean, pretty much anything you could imagine, be it a, on, I mean, I remember we, we, <laughs> we, were, we were down there one day, we were like, okay, what is that? What's that? What's that huge? gigantic wooden thing standing here. What is it? It's like, it's a wine press. Somebody was selling a wine press. <laughs> but there was the also all, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, a, like, yeah, like a huge, you know, so, but there was also all kinds of crazy clothes down there and, and lots of people selling music and they would have, you know, cassette players or something set up with little batteries and playing music so you'd hear you know, uh, Latin music on one corner and blues on the other corner. And we went hunting records, that was our thing. We went, we went looking for records. So, and you, there were certain people that would be there almost every week. And if you could find them, if they were there and they had good stuff, it was like, you know, red letter day, payday, you know. <laughs> so we would look for Cadillac Joe. I remember Cadillac Joe had, you know, because he had a Cadillac, and he'd have he'd have jazz records in the in the and his trunk. Name was Joe. Yeah, so there you go. yeah. And so <laughs> you'd be like, Cadillac Joe. Is Cadillac Joe here? Has anybody seen him? You know, <laughs> it's a pretty big area, so you walk around and see if you could find it. You know, yeah. And out of the trunk. Yeah, so yeah. So that was jazz that education because it, it you know we'd buy anything that we could afford that seemed interesting. You know. Oh, that's and, great. Yeah, yeah. Maxwell Street. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about this next tune of yours that we're going to play, Ekaru. Okay, Ekaru, I don't know where that title came from. I can't tell you. It doesn't, it's not anything in reverse like Horace Silver's Horace, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> and uh, it's, so, it's just there. It just appeared, like, that's what it's called. And probably... After you all hear this, then you'll understand <laughs> okay. why it now, has this, you know. Now, I want to press type. you one more time, because one thing I've realized in, in doing this <laughs> is lots of times I think we take for granted what we know as far as the construction of the piece. And I know with my students a lot, when we're watching performances or whatever, you know, especially now, it's actually one of the blessings that's come out of COVID is with, with the Zoom, we always have the chat there. And we're in mm. a class, students would probably feel a little uncomfortable to just be blurting out, well, what was that? Was this that? Is this, this sounds like that. In the chat, I mean, you could have a stream of consciousness oh, from 100 wonderful. people going. Yeah. So yeah. what I've noticed mm. is lots of times the comments will be like, did you do that on purpose? When that silence happened, was that planned? Was that written in the music? Do you have chords for this? Was that the melody or is that improvised? So I thought what would be cool, if you don't mind, is to put you on the spot and ask you to maybe describe what they're going to hear in words. What's the, the construct of, of your, your composition here? Okay, yeah, this is a tune that is meant to be a springboard or maybe a diving board for um, open form improvisation. In this tune, there are no parameters of chord change, chord changes, harmonic cycle, or given rhythmic pulse or feeling. Uh, there 
there's, there's none of that. So imagine bouncing up and down on the diving board and then you jump. And that's, that's what it's meant to do is to sort of jump us, the musicians, out into a space where we then get to do something in that space. And then there'll be, then there'll be another springboard maybe for another person or something. So, so it, it's, it's, that, it's that idea. And you have three of these springboard There's ideas. There's three of them separated by these spaces. And, and we organize it by doing different things in the, in the spaces. So on this version now, you'll hear, you'll hear the first one. Well, actually, you'll hear the whole thing. But then after that, we'll repeat it, and you'll hear different ones of us taking the space. So you'll hear these little, these little motifs will keep reoccurring in the improvisation. But, uh, other than that, there's no rules whatsoever. So we have uh, worked for years to develop a way of listening to what everybody else is doing, but also listening to what we're doing to make something cohesive musically without the crutch of any given certainty. And it's quite, it's quite thrilling. It's quite a large amount of risk. And, uh, and it's, really, it's really fun to do. And, and uh, we hope that you enjoy listening to it. It, it would be maybe a little unusual from you know, music that you've heard more often.
Absolutely, that's a, that's a good question. You know, the, 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 the tradition of, of African American music, jazz, is very, very much a vocal tradition. So right from the beginning, you have horns imitating voices and the, the whole amazing nuance of the blues and the, the way people sing blues and the way they change their voice to make the point they want to make in the in the blues is absolutely a huge part of the of the jazz tradition. So, uh, and now of course it goes both ways in that it, you know the the vocalists imitate the horns and the horns imitate the, the vocalists and there's this sort of wonderful communication. But this is this has been a very vocal uh, m music right right from the beginning. And there's lots of phrases in the in the uh, culture which which say like, okay, tell your story, tell your story, you know. So there's very much a, a, a feeling of a of a vocal thing here, but it's it is also true that starting somewhere around the early '60s, people in music, all music, started really realizing that. Everything is music, actually, including the fire engine and the jackhammer and the and the you know horns all angry beeping their horns and the wind in the pine trees, you know, and as has been known since time immemorial, the birds are are, are teachers. So it it has been very much a, a you know something that we who improvise have adopted the idea that, well, I can express what I want to express with a sound often even better than what I could do with a note. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, there's a time for sound. There's a time for, there's a time for, to just take it into, into sound and sort of sonic sculpture or sonic painting. The idea of, of the, the texture of the music, so to speak. That's the music, you know, it's like, oh, something really gritty or something really, really smooth that's brass. And, and what does that, what does that sound like? What, is, what does that sound like? And, and so um, that's something that's really fun to do. some time just seeing what sounds your instrument can make. Aside from the ones that you've been taught and the study of music and, and all of that, but just even to just see what that, well, what, what can I actually do with this thing? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like I do teach in improvisation at, at Stony Brook and one of the, you know, most fun things is opening up folks to start experimenting with the way they maybe approach their instrument when they were very young, like five years old. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a kid and you give them some instruments, they will just get in there and start messing around right away. Mm -hmm. and, and, and some of what we do
do is, is maintain that attitude of, oh, this is just mess around and see. Playfulness. Yeah, yeah it's playfulness. Yeah, it's, it's like, what can we do with the trunk? Right. You know, it's like, what is it good for? You know, what does it want to do? You know, what, you know what I find so interesting? <laughs> I, I've noticed a theme that uh, the majority of questions my students ask me, if they, they're asking how did he or she do this, if the recording they've listened to, Lewis Armstrong, Fred Holliday, or Charlie Parker, or something, mm -hmm. anybody, you know, mm -hmm. fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting is overwhelmingly nine out of ten times, what their ear has picked up on, what has communicated powerfully to them, is not something that has the simple answer, oh, that's the flat third. Oh, that was a scale. Oh, it's always that thing, that intangible, that's the sound. Uh -huh. It's not a note. It's not a chord. Right. It's not a mode. It's right. not a scale. It's like, well, hmm, how do I describe that? Yeah. That's a sound. That's Louis Armstrong kind of using air and I, that's what a is sound. that? Yeah, that's right. a sound. That's a but sound. it's interesting how that really communicates so powerfully. That's yeah. Right. That's wonderful. That's yeah. And that that is the essence of the music. And as we were talking before, I said, you know, the you're you're charged with trying to become who you are, which is what's your sound. Mm -hmm. What is yeah. your sound? And in in this way, the jazz music is very wonderfully created in that there isn't an ideal sound. Like in classical music, there's to some extent a really an idealized sound. There's an idealized orchestral trombone sound, which is this big, beautiful, round, gorgeous thing, you know, smooth from top register to the bottom of the register. But in jazz, it, it's more like, well, whatever your sound is, it's, it's acceptable. It's really, what can you do with it? Mm -hmm. Can you, like you say, if it reaches out and grabs somebody, that's success, mm -hmm. you know? That's right. So, yeah. so it's what your, what is your sound? And how many ways can you play a given note? Mm -hmm. Like how many different sounds can you make on that note, you know? And, and that's, a, that's a wonderfully uh, open challenge for everyone to, to work on. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Very important, like blur the line. Mm -hmm. You know, when does a note become a sound? Right? Like. <laughs> Say we play another tune. Yeah. Okay. Um, but this next song is a composition that I wrote quite recently. It's actually it's entitled Freedom. Mm. And it is uh, inspired by the great, incredible human being who was Billy Strahan. Billy Strayhorn had these four freedoms that he was known to discuss and talk about that were really the, the moral by which he lived. Mm. And one of which was the freedom of expression. Um, and another was freedom from hate unconditionally. No exceptions. a lot especially if he was writing from Tom Andrew Bellington that that freedom from self-pity had a lot to do with um, when you were experiencing challenges when you were experiencing pain or bad news that even throughout all of that that you could uh, strive for freedom from self-pity mm -hmm. um, another one was the freedom from the kind of pride that can make a man feel that he is better than his brother or his neighbor and these were quite and, and I, the one that I loved the most was the freedom from fear. But he would elaborate that it was fear from um, being 
something, or you know, from possibly doing something that might help another more than it would help himself. You know, there's a very strange spiritual this concept of of assisting and aiding and loving and supporting, not because there is in it something something in it for him. You know, it's really just about genuine um, love and concern and care. So it seems beautiful to us, and this tune is called Peter.
Well, man, I think we have time for one more. If we could do your mummy peg. Want to? I think that would be very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, you can try good. with the mummy peg. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, mummy peg is a game played with knives. <laughs> Another thing I'm not qualified for. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not actually a dangerous term. <laughs> we'll see about that. Okay. Well, we'll see. <laughs> actually, <yeah. laughs> actually, it could be a dangerous term. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
and uh, thank you. And thank you so much for just your spirit. And I, I <laughs> mean, just as your openness to just share what you do and be so encouraging in so many ways is like very inspiring. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Means, I know I speak for a lot of people when I mm. say that you mm. just really were positive and shared this music in such a beautiful way with so many of us. I'm very, we're very grateful for that. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, I, I yeah. do really believe that music itself has had so much in it. I mean, if you think about the people that you've met, you know, you've met so many people that, I mean, in general, all, all you know, generalizations are false, of course, <laughs> but, but in, in general, uh, the music does make you want to share it. Because it's a music of unity and a, a music of welcoming and a, a music of possibility, you know, this this gift. So um, it brings that out, and uh, I'm just trying to pay it forward, yeah. you know, very yeah. clearly for me now the realization that uh, I may not be doing this forever, and it would be nice to pass it on. Mm -hmm. Well, you're doing it. You are still doing it. Still, meanwhile, we're still doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I think we might have one short little blues in us, but before we do that, I just want to thank again our special guest of this new series, Ray Anderson yeah, on the trombone. Thank you, Ray. Thank you again. Yeah. And a very special uh, shout out to Mr. Steve Salerno on the guitar Thanks, here. Uh, I'm you, very Ray. happy to say that our next episode is going to feature a wonderful, wonderful Brazilian guitarist, Rubens de la Corte. So that is going to be our next episode, and wow. Steve and I are working on some great episodes that are going to focus on not only the guitar, but two of the most important uh, guitar makers, really, not only in this area, but arguably in the world. We're working on uh, two projects to get not only the guitar makers here, but some outstanding guitars as well. And to put the spotlight on Steve, who's always so gracious to back us up, but we're going to put him on in front and put the spotlight on. Thank you. And also get the conversation about guitars and how they're made and how their sound is produced. And, and what you get a wonderful opportunity to hear these different guitars in the very, very capable hands of Steve Salerno. So please keep posted for these wonderful new episodes coming up, music and conversation. So what do you say we uh, we do a little uh, mess around a little blues here, a little Yeti blues. Yeti Thank blues. you so much, folks. We hope you've enjoyed, and we do look forward to seeing you soon. Live from the Jazz Bar. Take care, and God bless. Here is the Yeti blues.